Also, we will be recording this uh, workshop and uh, presentation and the slides will be available after the session for, uh, for everyone. Well, um, I think we are a um, good number of people at the moment in the call. Um, if more people are joining afterwards, um, it's also fine. But I think we should uh, begin um, since we have a um, very complete agenda and I don't want to left uh, things uncovered. Uh, um, so, First of all, um, I will ask you all to be muted during the call, but in the FIQ session, um, so you can unmute yourself if you, if you prefer to ask a question, um, or you can use the chat instead, um, that, that's completely fine as well. Um, I will be having my video on now, but I will probably turn it off afterwards since uh, my connection is not very stable and I don't want you to uh, see my voice, like completely uh, hear my voice breaking or um, have other issues. Okay, so um, thank you very much for your interest in this workshop today. And also thank you very much to the UK uh, a reproducibility network for inviting me to have um, this um, workshop. And the idea today is to speak about um, ORCID in research and not only speaking about um, how can you use ORCID to identify yourself as authors or contributors in research, but also more things that we can do uh, with ORCID, particularly thinking of reproducibility and the fair ecosystem. So first of all, um, a bit about myself. Um, probably most of you don't know me, so I would like to introduce myself. My name is Paloma Marina Raifa. I've been working now for one year and eight months um, at ORCID. And my role at the moment is as engagement lead. I've been working as engagement lead for the EMEA region for one year. And then since April this year, I'm part of the consortium uh, team. Um, this means I mainly work with a group of, organ of organizations that uh, join uh, ORCID together. Um, one example is the JISC consortium in the UK. Um, a bit background of myself, I have a degree in physics and then I went to the scientific information and communication and did my PhD in information science. And I've been jumping between countries and um, 
and institutions. And I'm now back in Spain, which is my home country. And I'm happy to chat with any of you uh, per email or um, in, uh, in Twitter, where I'm quite active and usually post things about identifiers, research, and so on. Particularly meta research, which is a area um, I'm in especially interested in. So, but now let's begin with our workshop uh, today. So um, I will be turning my video off now um, to guarantee um, connection stability. So what are we going to do today? So the first part of this workshop is thought to be more um, interactive. So we are going to be covering some ORCID myths and we are going to be speaking about possibilities with ORCID. Uh, for this interaction part, I will be uh, showing you some statements and uh, you can um, tip in the chat if you think this is true or false, and then we can discuss whether that's true or false and why. Um, and after this part, we will have a QA session as well. If something that I mentioned wasn't clear enough, um, we will have then a five minutes break um, and then speak about how you can use ORCID in scholarly communication, uh, being a researcher. Then we will have some Q&A as well. Um, then again, a break. And the last part will be the fair data and reproducibility and how um, ORCID integrates in that, in that part. So... Then um, I will begin with this first part, whether that's a myth or a fact and or true or false, and you can um, and you can type in the chat what do you think. So the first uh, question or statement is ORCID is another profile researchers need to fill in. Do you think that's true, false? Uh, and be completely honest. So if your experience is that ORCID is another profile, then please let me know as well. Yeah, I see some kind of 50-50 here. Um, so this is uh, what we see a lot of times. So, OK, another thing. I have my ORCID ID, I have a Google Scholar, I have a ResearchGate profile, I have these and that, and I need to um, take care of all of those identifiers, profiles, and so on. Um, so the idea behind ORCID um, was to create an identifier um, for people uh, that can be linked to all people uh, related to research, be conform uh, with international norms, be free for researchers, and help researchers to connect uh, their selves and their um, contributions. So um, publications, textual publications, data, software, um, artistic performance, and so on, depending on their area. And something that I um, usually um, use as a uh, comparison is that um, we can think of ORCID as a passport, since we can use ORCID in different uh, systems, in different countries, and in different disciplines. And then we also have other identifiers that could be um, our um, local national identity cards, for example, that we can use in our institutional repository or that we can use for our national platforms. Um, and in some cases with passports, we need a visa in order to be able to travel to other countries. And this is exactly the same uh, with ORCID. So in some cases, we need to grant particular access to uh, some platforms in order for them to read the data contained in our ORCID records. And the ORCID record is actually that, so to speak, profile page, even though it's not exactly a profile that we have and we share with our colleagues and when we publish. And we can have um, our employment data there, um, also education and qualification, membership, it works 
peer reviews and also um, research resources. But research, research resources can be, uh, can be only added by organizations. So next one. ORCID is a commercial um, US organization. Yeah, so I see that most of you are saying it's false, uh, but it, there are some uncertainty as well. So this is this is not correct. This is false. Um, Orchid is a um, organization. Um, the idea is that we have a sub sustainable community driven support model. This is why um, organizations, so uh, members, so, so uh, research institutes or universities can become ORCID members and then support um, ORCID. Uh, it is governed by our executive board and um, the members of the executive board are also candidates from the organizations that are members of the uh, of ORCID and most of them are non-for-profit as well. So universities or national funders. Um, and at the moment, we have members in over 50 countries and national consortia as well. The UK is one of the national consortia, as I mentioned before. And from the organization perspective, we are based in 16 different countries. Uh, we are about 35 people and um, we speak around 15 language in total. So we cover um, way more than just the US. So, and this is a question that, or a statement that affects researchers directly. Uh, researchers control who can access data on their records. Is this true or false? I'm very happy to see that most of you are saying this is true uh, because it is actually true. But um, I had the um, I had the impression that maybe we don't have that so clear on the record. So we have two possibilities to um, to guarantee that researchers control who can access their data. So on the one hand, when one uh, registers uh, for an ORCID ID, one can choose exactly the visibility, either to everyone, only to trust parties, or uh, only me, so completely private, to the whole record. But then each entry in the record can um, be changed. So each entry can have different access rights. Also, whenever we interact with a platform using ORCID, for example, here we have in the middle of my um, slide, the German National Library. If we are interacting with the German National Library, then um, we see that uh, we can authorize that and that institution to read the data and modify the data or not. And be also aware that um, giving this type of access or permissions don't, um, doesn't mean that that organization is going to be able to, um, to modify all the data you have. They are going to be able to add um, new information and only modify the information they have added. So it's, it's very, um, very direct. And if at the point of time you decide that you don't want anymore to have that organization 
controlling part of the information in your record, you can simply revoke permission and then that organization won't be able to modify them um, anymore. And this is the way we use to guarantee that operations within Orchid are also GDPR compliant. Apart from other work uh, related to data protection, you see here um, a, um, a, a report that the German consortium organized for um, for Germany, but we can, but we see as well several resources related to data protection and security within Wicked in our own webpage. One example is the privacy policy that I linked um, below. So if you are, have concerns or are, are um, or maybe your colleagues have concerns, then please um, share that. Okay, next one. Public data on the ORCID registry is open to all. Yeah. I see some uh, questions here, maybe true. Um, not sure, unsure. This is perfectly fine that you don't know that you don't know all the answers. Um, and I know that this statement might be a bit tricky, also from the way I, I wrote it. So public data on the registry is open to all. This is true. But this doesn't mean that all data in the ORCID registry is so as I mentioned before, we can have also private data or we can have data that is, um, that is only for certain parties. Um, so one thing that we do every year is we publish the uh, public data um, file. This file or maybe files with an S um, are a set of um, files containing all the data that is set to public or to everyone in the ORCID record. Um, and we do that with the purpose to contribute to open data. And also we know that several organizations use uh, did this public data file to enrich their metadata. For example, some universities, open air, as a platform, and also some researchers use um, this type of data to find collaboration networks um, or to find publication clusters as well. So, and we have uh, this data in the XML format, um, and also we have a, a policy to explain how we um, uh, how we would like people to work with this data. Okay, an ORCID ID can only be linked to publications. I really like a comment here, false, I hope. <laughs> yes, uh, this, is, uh, this is false. Um, even though um, we know that in many cases, um, several institutions only use uh, or only connect ORCID to publications, but um, there are many further different work types. Um, so in the textual part, we have book, we have book chapter, conference paper, preprint, but we have also non-textual publications or non-textual um, resources or contributions, uh, production in general. So for example, data sets, software, um, also um, uh, physical objects, uh, public presentations or, or speeches, um, also um, artistic performance, depending on the area that person is um, working. Also, um, we have um, included 
the contribution roles, the credit. And this is a way to um, guarantee that we acknowledge the participation of each person in a certain type of publication or production in general. So uh, we know that in the process of research, we might have people that have contributed with the idea, um, writing the, 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 uh, the paper or, or creating the object, collecting data, um, programming the software and so on. And others have only reviewed at the end the final version and things. So in order to be able to identify their contribution, we have been including uh, recently these roles. And then uh, one example of other type of publications or, or other type of contributions is the inclusion of data management plans. And one example is the California Digital Library that um, pushes this type of, um, of work to ORCID in a way that we can identify both the author of that uh, data management plan and also the data management plan as a tool to inform how we are going to work with data through the um, research. Yeah, okay. ORCID can be implemented in different types of workflows. What do you think? Yeah, so this one is uh, true as well. And when I um, speak of different type of, of um, workflows, I've seen that um, a couple of people were um, some a bit uncertain saying, don't know exactly about this statement is that we can connect ORCID not only when we um, publish, so um, we can expect uh, a big publisher, for example, to allow us to provide our ORCID ID, but there are other workflows where we can use ORCID as well. And afterwards, we are going to see a couple of examples of uh, uses within the UK. So for example, we have the possibility of have an ORCID ID in a preprint server or for funders when, um, when we are, um, when we are uh, presenting a proposal, uh, also in institutional repositories, when we um, use our institutional repositories, for example, to have our open access publications, also uh, in the case of our uh, thesis and dissertations, in peer review, which is something that I'm mentioning um, in a couple of slides as well, and many other uh, workflows. So this is also another way to highlight that um, ORCID is not only for publications thinking of a journal article, um, but to other type of production as well. And I would like to um, see a, uh, I would like to take a comment here, which is um, that there is no link to a blog or a YouTube channel. And this is, um, this is partially true. So ORCID doesn't integrate or have a direct connection with YouTube for example, but um, if a person has a video in YouTube, uh, for example, a video of a presentation, that can be added to an ORCID record as a le lecture or speech using that work type. Um, and in case of uh, a blog post, so the, the article or the post that someone adds to a blog, in that case, uh, we can use the uh, the magazine article or the simple article um, or also website or resource. This, if we want to consider the uh, publication, so the work better say, 
However, if we are uh, thinking of a link between uh, the ORCID record and the corresponding blog or the YouTube channel, we can use um, the uh, websites. So I'm going to jump a couple of slides back. Um, I, I don't know, it is going in the other direction. So apologies for that. I'm going to jump back to this slide where I was showing um, where I was showing the record. You see here that there is a part called websites and social links. So in that case, we can add a blog po uh, sorry, a blog, the general web page or um, a YouTube channel. The same thing I did here with my Google Scholar or uh, my GitHub, for example. So just as a way to, to cover that information. And now I'm jumping um, forward again. Yeah, so we were here. ORCID is only for science, technology, uh, engineering and mathematics disciplines. I really like that you are all mentioning that this is false. Um, uh, because it is. However, I have to say that um, the adoption of ORCID in the STEAM uh, disciplines is higher than in the, um, in the arts and humanities. Um, that might be, um, even though ORCID supports identification across disciplines, because um, not many uh, platforms so far have been uh, so involved in author of authentication and also because the word types might not be that well known. So I've been mentioning before that uh, uh, among word types, we have artistic performance, we have digital object, we have book, um, or we have um, lecture or speech. And we have slowly more, um, more uh, platforms and users that are aware of these word types and they are beginning to use them. One example, for example, is the Open Library of Humanities or uh, also open editions or the journal platform of the University of Heidelberg and also the Auckland Museum. And the Auckland Museum has been using um, ORCID for author authentication as well. So um, we are always happy to know more use cases and people working in areas different to the STEAM disciplines that are using ORCID. Uh, but I recognize that we still need uh, to do some work on that area. And ORCID is only used in the global north. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is clearly false. Um, and this um, represents a uh, interesting part because while most members, so um, that part of supportive community are located in Europe and North America, um, we have a few in, uh, in Africa, Middle East, Asia and um, Latin America, but most of them are in the global north. Users are located all over the world. And one particular uh, highlight here is Brazil. So we have a lot of Brazilian users um, and um, also a lot of Brazilian small journals that are supporting ORCID. So I think at the moment we, um, we are moving through a uh, process to include and be more inclusive with all countries and communities. Okay, and this is something that I will uh, be mentioning before when I come to the use of ORCID in uh, peer review, but um, what do you think here? ORCID supports only uh, open peer review. Mm 
Yes, so you were mostly right. This is false. So ORCID supports um, all type of peer review. So uh, we cover both um, the open peer review and also the anonymous or blind peer review. Um, so we required um, that the um, organizations adding peer review and acknowledging that researchers have reviewed for the journals in particular, that they can, um, we require that they add the, the role, the uh, group identifier, in that case, the ISSN of the journal and the organization adding the data and the uh, type of, um, of review and date, but not the content of the review. So in that case, for example, you can see the first, um, the first screenshot is from F1000, adding open peer review, and then you see the review subject, and you can see what was mentioning and the identifier of the review. In the second case, um, that was added by um, PLOS, and you see that um, the, um, the review subject is not appearing there. So it's not a um, open one. Um, this is because in some cases, when we chat with researchers, they are um, a bit concerned with reviews. So both for um, articles or, or production and also for project. Um, because of course, you expect that a review, if it is not open, it's kind of confidential. So then why adding it to ORCID? But at the same time, one spends a lot of time doing a proper review and, and checking everything. So why not having that recognized? So it's, um, it's this double part. So in the case, the journal um, is offering blind peer review, the data in ORCID won't identify the article either. If um, open peer review is supported, then uh, so will it in the ORCID record. And ORCID supports only English language published uh, research. Yes, exactly. This is false. Um, and um, we have several languages uh, in the um, ORCID registry. Of course, the metadata language is mostly English, but we have also a, a big percentage of Spanish, Polish, Portuguese, uh, German, Danish, French, Russian, um, and Italian, for example. So the user interface as well is translated into 12 languages. So um, the, the most spoken languages are there. And here you see a screenshot of my own um, ORCID record, where you see publication in German, in English, and in Spanish. So um, these languages are widely supported and the characters as well. So don't, uh, don't be afraid is, uh, if you have suddenly a, um, a publication in, in a non, um, with non-English characters or even with a uh, non-English alphabet. So let's say it's Cyrillic alphabet or the Arabic alphabet. And yes, Portuguese is, uh, is a very uh, used language within the, within the, uh, the registry. Um, and also one of the languages supported in the user interface. So that was the end of the myth and or true or false. Um, I don't know if you have further questions about that or things that are um, remained. I see also in the chat, thank you very much, Adam, for sharing the uh, support link or how to add personal websites to the ORCID record. 
of course, websites can be also added by some organizations, but this is not the most common section um, in, in some cases. Do you um, have further questions on that or any other things you would like to comment? Then um, just as a reminder, the next two sections, one will be on the use of ORCID in the, um, as, as a researcher in different platforms and then about fair data. Um, Um, yeah, I would like to take these questions. Uh, there are other platforms offering the same services like Pavlons. What are your advantages? So um, Pavlons and Orchid are different. They have some common aspects and they can be connected as well. So you can have a direct connection between uh, Pavlons and Orchid. Um, but the purpose is different. So the idea with ORCID is to have, first of all, a, a persistent and unique identifier. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, that type of identifier can be used in all platforms, regardless uh, where the platform is located or the subject and so on. Um, one of those platforms is in fact Pavlons. And um, then you can connect um, ORCID with different activities of the research process. So where um, the, the organization you are affiliated to, um, where, you, uh, where you studied, your membership, works, um, peer review. Peer review can be added through Pavlons or directly through the uh, publisher. So, and also Pavlons is only connected to uh, Clarivate, so Web of Science, and Orchid has other connections to other platforms as well. In this case, I won't say uh, this is a competition, Orchid is better or Orchid is worse it's only a different platform with a different purpose. Uh, that will be the idea, but in any case, both Pavlons and Orchid are interoperable and this is something that we should always consider. And here, this second question, um, it's really important. How do you manually add co-authors in Orchid? And the thing at the moment is you can't. So there is no option at the moment to add um, co-authors manually. However, this is under development. So the uh, timeline at the beginning was that this month, so in December, that option would be ready. I can't guarantee that this is going to be that way. So probably at the beginning of next year, but the option is going to be available and also supporting the credit roles I mentioned before. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, credit roles, I'm writing them in the chat. Um, these are uh, involved, as mentioned, not only writing a contribution, but, uh, but also analyzing the data, um, accurating the data, writing software, um, reviewing the final version, and so on. So there are um, up to 14 roles that can be added or that will be available um, to, to, manual, uh, to add them manually at ORCID. So I hope that that helps. If there are no further questions, then we will have five minutes break. Oh, I see another question popping up. Ah, okay, uh, it was only thanks. Uh, so we have five minutes break um, and, and at quarter two, we will uh, continue with uh, this part. So the uses of wicked in scholarly infrastructure as a researcher.
So um, we are back from our uh, five minutes break. Um, I would like to, um, before um, beginning speaking about the uses of WorkIt in scholarly infrastructure, so when you publish or when you request a funding and so on, um, there was a, a comment in the chat for um, people fairly new to ORCID or that have been using ORCID uh, just for some months and would like to understand more about ORCID. Um, apart from ORCID being an identifier, how can people connect information to ORCID or how can people add information to ORCID? I've shared here um, the um, one of our support uh, pages, which um, is the support.orchid.org. And the article I linked there is the What is Orchid article. But if you surf that page a bit, you will see several common questions around Orchid, around adding information. For example, the page that Adam uh, shared before about adding um, a web page to, to the Orchid record was also from that support page. And also, uh, there is this web page, info.orchid.org, uh, um, that lists some benefits for researchers and has a um, or some links to common questions or, or um, aspects about the Orchid record as well. Um, and not yet, so they are not ready yet, uh, but um, the ORCID communication team um, is working on some uh, researchers, uh, sorry, on some resources for researchers uh, that should be published soon, and that could help um, researchers to understand better what ORCID, is, what, what ORCID is and how they can use ORCID. Uh, but also institutions that would like to organize a workshop, for example, for their researchers and work uh, them through how to register an ORCID ID and how to add information to an ORCID ID and so on. So, great. Uh, that um, said, um, I will now begin with the uses of ORCID in scholarly infrastructure. So, uh, one uh, main thing that we should bear in mind is the benefits for researchers. So um, why should I use ORCID if I already have another profile or what uh, brings me ORCID in general? So the first thing is the uh, reliable connection uh, with works, awards, affiliations, peer reviews, and so on. So the idea is to be in a connected global um, research world, and this is what we can facilitate through Wicked. Also, prevent um, mistaken uh, identity or uh, disambiguation. This helps uh, not only um, if you change your name or your family name, uh, but also if you, for example, uh, change um, or um, if you um, so if you change your your name or your uh, family name, but also if there are many people with the same name or the same surname to identify them correctly. Um, also, what I've been mentioning before, researchers control the record and they can manage the information that is connected and how that information is shared. So um, ORCID is driven by this user-driven principle. So the user should be always in the middle, in this case, the researcher. And the idea and the final goal is to uh, save researchers time. Um, so in that case, uh, we have the principle, enter once, uh, reuse often. Uh, this is our main, uh, our main goal, so that our researchers only need to enter the information once and they can uh, reuse that information as many times as possible. 
Um, and then uh, the recognition and the discoverability of research outputs. Um, we need to highlight that ORCID is free of charge, so there is no cost for, the, for researchers to maintain it. And um, it is a persistent, so then lifelong digital name that can be used in different systems. And um, as I mentioned before, it can be connected to several uh, researcher uh, workflows. So when publishing, when um, um, editing a dissertation or a thesis, when uh, asking for, for funding and so on. So when publishing, um, this is a common example that we can find. We would like to publish a paper and then we go to um, and then we go to uh, the publisher um, interface, and we might see one of these buttons. So either create or connect your ORCID ID or sign in with ORCID uh, to facilitate that connection with ORCID. And one common authentication page will be the next screenshot. So in that case, we have here um, a, a journal from the University of Malaga in the south of Spain. And that, um, that journal is asking me if I would like to share my ORCID ID as part of this login process. Then if I authorize access, my ORCID ID will be part of the article metadata and will guarantee that I'm correctly identifier as an author. Um, and the same that we see here, I think I can use a pointer, um, but I can see the option, no problem. So uh, the, the same that um, I see here, get your ORCID ID, there are other options that can be available. For example, um, adding information to the ORCID record uh, in the case that that journal can um, add my, my uh, publication afterwards or uh, peer review contributions. So when publishing, um, the main uses of ORCID are um, attribution, so I'm recognizing that the person is, um, is who is because of the ORCID um, ID. Um, I can recognize different level of contribution as well. I added here shots from uh, plus one and we see um, the main person, uh, the main author, and then we have the roles, um, what, was uh, that person participation in the in the project and then or in the article and then we see the ORCID ID and also to acknowledge peer review activities so um, here um, you see this other ORCID record with a e-life um, review activity and a nature chemical biology and nature uh, for, um, uh, sorry, nature communications. So in that case, we see that um, nature publishing group has added that contribution as well. Um, this is, as mentioned before, a way to recognize that uh, people, uh, researchers spend a lot of time uh, reviewing articles and, and this contribution should be um, available as well. And this one is an example of blind peer review. So um, the, we know that this person has reviewed for the Nature, uh, Nature Chemical uh, Biology Journal, but we don't know which article or what that person wrote about the article. Then um, as part of your institutional system, I added here um, the University of Bristol uh, because of being a, a British organization, having uh, an integration with ORCID in the, um, in the research portal, but it can be another one. So this is just a, um, an example. So many um, institutions 
institutions, many universities, research centers have um, ORCID as part of their research portal, repositories, and so on. This means we can add our ORCID ID to uh, the publications or the resources that we publish or that we have within the portal or the repository. Each university or research institute has different uh, workflows. So when exactly can I provide my ORCID ID? It depends. But the main thing is that it is always provided uh, through authentication. And what is authentication? This part. When I have this type of window where I need to authorize access, this is the way I have to actually give my ORCID ID uh, and be, um, be aware that I'm giving my ORCID ID and not that my ORCID ID is uh, randomly circulating. Also, um, a very important part of using one of your um, institutional repositories is to have your production in a in an open um, space as well. So this is also a part of um, the contribution to disseminate research. Then uh, in your national funding system. So in the case of the UK, we have uh, a big funder for uh, which is Welcome Trust, um, and Welcome Trust has this um, this management system where um, you can um, where you can also add uh, or provide your ORCID um, ID as part of the funding um, request. And you see here in this um, in this link that I um, added how Welcome Trust is working with ORCID. Another example in national funding systems is the case of the um, UK um, Research and Innovation. And um, the UK Research and Innovation is a particular case because it is the first funder worldwide, I have to say, that um, is using uh, the peer review section to acknowledge project review. So if a researcher is part of the project reviewers of UKRI, then um, they can have um, the, um, their uh, work also in ORCID. And um, we have a, a more detailed explanation of this workflow in the two links that I have uh, below. Um, so in the case of the U of UKRI, there is this uh, GS uh, system and people can link their ORCID ID there in their profiles. And then when they contribute to UKRI, either getting funding from them or reviewing a, um, a project, they can have this information also in ORCID. So this is another example on how um, ORCID is integrated in different workflows. And the main thing um, when we speak about ORCID and the role of ORCID is that we consider interoperability. So um, interoperability is that part, enter once, reuse often. Uh, researchers should be in the middle and then researchers can connect with um, their employer, for example, a university or, or a research center, um, a publisher, um, this can be a journal or this can be another type of repository where you added data or software, and then um, the funder as well. And I've added here, a, um, I've added two, uh, other logos, one is Crossref and one is Datasite. You might be familiar with both um, Crossref and Datasite, but uh, they are um, DOI's re uh, registration agencies. We work uh, from ORCID closely with them and we have the so-called auto update. This means if a journal or a repository registers a DOI uh, for any type of production, paper, uh, data set, software, 
And the ORCID ID of the researcher, the author, is included as part of the metadata, then you will receive a notification from Crossref and DataSide asking uh, to include that work in your ORCID record. So this is an example of the interoperability I'm mentioning. So you don't really have to be adding everything manually, but you will see at the end your publications, your works, affiliations, and so on there. Um, and the idea is to spare time and that you have this time free actually for other things that should be more important than adding data to um, ORCID or any other type of registry. Okay, this is the end of this part. Um, and I see there are um, some um, questions. Um, Do you also interact with the other DOIs agencies, for example, Medra? Uh, this is a very, very good question. Um, the answer at the moment is no, in the same way uh, that we have with Crossref and, and DataSide, um, but we are in the process of. Uh, at the moment, if a DOI has been registered with Medra, um, we have an option to add a work directly um, adding the DOI. So if you go to the, um, to the uh, works section, you will see the option add using DOI, then you can copy there uh, the DOI and the metadata will be retrieved. But this type of auto update with Medra is at the moment not available. We have, an import tool with a the Japanese DUI agency, but not with Medra at the moment. Um, yeah. Uh, then how long does it take for Crossref to inform ORCID about my new papers? It is pretty automatic. So as soon as the uh, DUI is correctly uh, registered with, um, with the uh, ORCID record, or sorry, with the ORCID ID in this case, then almost automatically you will see um, the, uh, you will see a notification from Crossref. So if you have already granted permissions uh, to Crossref, then uh, the work will appear. Um, and if not, um, you, it might be uh, that you need to grant permission to ORCID, uh, sorry, to Crossref. Um, there are some cases, but this is not with uh, Crossref, but with journals or some platforms, um, they might do a kind of a bulk upload. So they might say, okay, we add uh, information to ORCID once per month or once uh, every uh, 15 days, for example. And this might take longer, but with Crossref um, is automatic. Are there any further questions? I don't see anything at the moment. Uh, well, okay, this is great. So um, then maybe a five minute break is uh, too long, but let's have a two, three minutes break and then we will uh, go to the last part. Of, of the workshop and then we will have time for more questions if you if you wish and also I can um, I can share with you some resources that are available in the ORCID webpage in case that that's of interest. So 
So we are um, coming back from our mini short break. Um, yeah, I just don't want it to be very heavy with a lot of information. Um, this last part, or in this last part, um, I would like to comment on different um, on different ideas and concepts that you might um, that you might have heard within um, reproducibility, uh, data uses, uh, data management, research data management, and so on, and. In, in this case um, is um, fair and the reproducibility ecosystem. So um, you probably um, are some of you more, some of you less familiar with the fair principles. Uh, fair stands for um, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And this is a framework, or these principles are a framework related to the data, research data, metadata, and also the infrastructure containing that information. So um, in many uh, research data management plans or funders recommendations, and in some cases also data repositories recommendations, you will see that part of FAIR. So make your data FAIR, fairification of your data and so on. But at the end, um, some problems that I've, uh, not really problems, but some obstacles that I've seen um, in the past are related to um, exactly what is this in practice and how can I make my data FAIR and how can I guarantee that other people are going to find my data, are going to be able to access them, are going to be able to reproduce them. So there are a lot of details. ORCID is a persistent identifier, as I've um, mentioned before. And um, given this uh, condition as persistent identifier, it has also a role in the uh, FAIR principles. So I've listed here the main principles where ORCID um, has a direct contribution. And the first one is that the metadata are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. Um, so metadata are all the data that we use to describe our contribution. So in that case, one of that uh, is the entity author or creator or collaborator. And here we can use the ORCID ID as this type of persistent identifier. The other one is that data are described with rich metadata. So that we have as many metadata as we can, but also that these metadata are complete and that we have information about the provenance of this metadata. And if you have seen the ORCID record, you will see that every single entry has this part source and then a name. It can be your name if you have entered that information manually, or it can be an organization's name, for example, Crossref or University of Bristol. This means that Crossref or the University of Bristol have added that information, but we have these um, uh, provenance details. So another uh, fair principle is that the metadata clearly and explicitly include the identifier of the data they describe. So here we have the inclusion of identifiers. DOIs can identify our production, handles can identify our production as well. Um, and there, uh, there is a long list or, uh, of identifiers that are supported within ORCID. Um, and 
If you see, and now since we are going to have enough time, we can have a look at the ORCID record per se and see exactly where different PEDs are added in the different entries that we can have uh, in the ORCID record and registry. I see a typo there that I will correct uh, for, the, um, for the slides that I shared after this presentation. Then we have the metadata are registered, the data and metadata are registered or indexed in a um, searchable resource. And here we have, of course, the ORCID registry, but the ORCID registry offers the ORCID public API where you can search for data um, that are public, as I mentioned before, and also the public data file that I described in one of the myths uh, statement. And these are the uh, findable principles. And then when it comes to the interoperable uh, principles, we see that uh, data and, the metada and metadata use a formal, accessible, shared, and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. So one thing is that ORCID ID uh, is a standard. Also, the data is available using XML as I mentioned for the public data file. And we always use uh, international standards for the construction of the registry. Uh, standards like, like CASRI or standards like uh, uh, the different PITs, so DOI, ROAR, and so on, so that we can have actually this interoperability between platforms as the interoperability I mentioned between um, data site, uh, Crossref, and ORCID. And also metadata include qualified reference, references to other metadata. And um, here is also the presentation of bits always using a, a HTTPS protocol so that we can discover more metadata. So for example, if I say, okay, this person um, has authored uh, this paper. So person is the author of, and also this person works at uh, the University of Bristol. And then I add the uh, ROAR ID of the University of Bristol. Then I can click on that and find more information about the University of Bristol and so on. So it's a way to connect um, information. So to, a way to connect um, production, affiliations, authors, and at the end, a way to track these publications, a way to track this production, and also to um, inform and analyze better that situation, and at the end, be more visible and easily discoverable. Um, from a data science librarianship point of view, uh, my colleague and I um, wrote this paper, which is in Portuguese, but um, it uh, references some part of uh, ORCID roles in the FAIR principles. And one example that we have also in the UK and that has been uh, recently updated is uh, FAIR sharing. This, this platform to, uh, to uh, collaborate, with metadata standards, data, share, and also have several sources. So um, as part of this platform, we can log in using um, ORCID, and they are also working uh, in the possibility to exchange information as well with ORCID. So ORCID is part of uh, this ecosystem as well. And then more um, when it comes to the reproducibility and data responsibilities, um, it is important to uh, know exactly who is responsible for the data. Because as part of our research, and I include myself in that because I, I've seen that during my PhD, okay, is the university, is the researcher, uh, can I publish this openly? If someone has questions 
about uh, that data, who is responsible for that. Um, and it is important to actually identify the, uh, the person responsible for the data. And as part of uh, this, we, we have um, tools like data management plans that I've mentioned before, um, and in particular, the machine actionable one. And um, one of the principles that um, are available for these uh, data management plans is uh, the use of persistent identifiers and uh, control vocabularies. So here um, we see another example of connecting entities in a um, machine readable way uh, using the corresponding persistent identifier for authors, in that case, using an ORCID ID. So the main goal at the end is to retrieve as much information as we can and to connect as much entities as we can um, and have a clear and reliable connection between people and research. And before uh, we go to the questions part, I, I would like to share the uh, ORCID registry with you directly so that um, you can see the, uh, the things I was mentioning before about um, identifiers and how they are represented and so on, because I think this is going to be a more uh, visible way and, and visual in, in general. So I will use my own um, ORCID um, ID as an example. Uh, this is not because I think my record is fantastic, just because um, I haven't uh, I haven't picked any other <laughs> any other um, uh, one as an example. So I'm going to close all this, and then um, we can um, we can have a look at it. So this is an orchid record with the new interface. So here are the um, website and social links that I've been mentioning before. And here we have other IDs. This section, other IDs, can't be added by a researcher. They uh, have to be added always using um, another platform. So for example, the Scopus um, ID, I added to my record when I connected to Scopus to import publications and the researcher ID when I connected to Pablons as well to import uh, peer reviews in that case. So if we go to the employment part, um, you will see here, for example, the Technical University of Vienna. That was my, my previous role. Um, and if I click on show more details, uh, then you will see that we have here the corresponding um, identifier, in this case, the fun breath, that is added with a um, URL that I can click and get more details on that. The same with uh, the ORCID, uh, my current ORCID uh, role. If I open here, I see that um, there are many, um, there are many, uh, IDs, I see the ROAR ID, I see the GRID ID, I see also the um, Wikidata identifier, the entry in Wikipedia about ORCID, and all these are, um, are clickable. And also in that case, there is a, uh, there is a um, URL where I can see the whole ORCID team. Even though in, um, in entries that I've added myself, for example, one of my previous roles in uh, the north part of Germany, then here you see as well the other identifiers. In this case, there is no, um, there is no URL per se, but um, you can also see the different identifiers. If we go to the work uh, section, 
we have the same situation. So um, let's speak. Um, yeah, for example, this one that um, is the source is Crossref, and here I see the corresponding DOI, so the corresponding identifier that I can click on, and also uh, the URL and more. I, uh, so the contributors and more information about how to cite this part. And something that you might be wondering is this one, for example. You see preferred source of three. And then I can open it here and I see that one source is data site, one source is data site again, and the other source is myself. And um, so I, I've chosen data sites to be my preferred source. And then I merge um, the other entry because that was a duplicate. So I merge both um, entries and due to that merging, Orchid adds a third source that is myself because I combined these three. And this is the same here, for example, but we can have also other situations where um, we have two sources and those are grouped together because the ID was the same. And um, let me find another example here. For example, this one. In that case, um, that um, work this, this uh, publication here wasn't added directly to my ORCID record via Crossref because my ORCID ID wasn't added as part of the metadata. Then what I did was um, I went to Crossref metadata, found this um, article and added or imported it into my ORCID record. And this is why you will see the information about the provenance saying um, Paloma via Crossref metadata search, because it was me claiming authorship for that paper, but um, it was an orchid, sorry, it was in Crossref directly uh, pushing that information to my orchid record. Okay, and then let me close this. And um, more or less the same is what we have for peer reviews. So here um, is one of my contributions to a peer review, for example. And then if I show more details, I will see the identifier of this peer review, which if I open is the, and it loads, is the review page of uh, Pablons, but um, it doesn't contain the content uh, of the um, review. It says it's unavailable because even though I added it to uh, Pablons, I, I would like to keep it um, private because it's a blind peer review. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and get the questions. Um, so I will uh, be um, taking the, the chat and if I need to open my screen again or um, I will add my, my video, I think it would be, uh, my connection should be enough uh, to be with video in that part. Um, so if I need to share my screen again to maybe show more examples um, about your questions, I'm happy to do that. Um, so one question is, recently I uploaded a preprint of the submitted manuscript to Met uh, Shift. Uh, when adding co-authors, I was asked to provide the ORCID ID by entering their names, followed by the drop-down menu with all relevant IDs. More of them did not have affiliations and I could not identify my co-authors from the list of people with the same names. It is possible to make mandatory that researchers provide all the information when they register their ORCID ID. So this is a very interesting situation actually. And the answer is actually no, 
because um, we can't mandate, so from Orchid directly, we can't mandate that uh, people add certain type of information to the Orchid record. However, that workflow that you are uh, describing is of course not the ideal one because um, we have been always mentioning that um, the idea of Orchid is to identify people even though they might have the same name. So uh, for example, I can be not the only Paloma Marin in the world. So what happens if another person has my name? Um, then having this type of lookup functionality isn't ideal because you can't, of course, identify who is uh, the person exactly. The ideal situation is to have this authentication um, workflow. And this is, of course, for your case, not a direct solution because this doesn't depend uh, on, on you, but on the platform. So um, what is a workaround or a short-term solution that your uh, co-authors provide you with that uh, ORCID ID so that even though the record contains no information, you are um, still able to identify who that person is. Um, I will go to the next one. I've used the break to check my ORCID. Uh, I've added a data set uh, link, but I'm intrigued. Yeah, okay, this is a good one. Uh, is under other data sets and is not counted uh, as a publication type. As a repository manager, we spend our time time underlining that a data set is a publication in its own. So um, a nice surprise, pure isn't important data set record. It imports other publications. Okay, here there are, are, are two main points that I definitely would like to address. So the main one is a data set, is a type of contribution. Within ORCID, we have been using this publication only for textual uh, parts. Considering that a data set can be textual, but can be also heterogeneous. So we can have data sets containing uh, images, or binary data and so on. So numerical data per se, like um, uh, observa observational data and so on. This um, part of adding a data set under other is not ideal at all. So what we've been, uh, or what we are going to do is that we are going to remove those categories. So at the moment, if one, um, maybe this is, it's, it's going to be better if I show uh, this. Uh, let me log in into Orchid because otherwise I will be saying things and people will be uh, completely out of my description and I don't want this to happen. So let me go into my Orchid record and explain to everyone exactly what I'm mentioning so that um, you're aware of that. Um, I have a two-factor authentication, so this might be a bit long. Okay, there we are. I'm going to share my screen again and hope it works for everyone. So this is my ORCID record now. And you see that uh, if it has changed a bit because I'm now uh, logged in and this is the, um, the um, part where I can edit. So if I go to uh, publications or works in general, I see the add function here and I can add uh, manually. And then I have this page. The first thing is select a work category, which is at the moment mandatory. So you see here three, uh, sorry, four options, publication, conference, intellectual property, and other. And exactly, if you click on other, 
then uh, then you see the work type can be among other data sets, but annotation, artistic performance, um, data management plan, data sets, and so on. So, and there is also an other other for whatever type of publication software is also under other research technique and so on. So it is indeed not ideal if we want to promote that researchers share their um, data or their underlying data that we consider that word category as other. Okay, we have some importance for publication, conferences, intellectual property, and then this other category as a box when, where we put other uh, things. So um, this has been requested by several members, several uh, researchers as well. So what we are going to do is to remove this part, this word category. Why? Because at the end, the, date, the metadata per se, it's only the work type. This word category is only a way to facilitate classification, but that, that's the only role. And if you see here, for example, um, this is tagged as other, or uh, here you see only journal article, but you don't see publication journal article. You only see the work type. This is why this category um, is useless, because actually we aren't displaying it at all. This answers the first part. And the other part is that a pure, pure um, for those that aren't that familiar with infrastructure is a software for CRIS systems within institutions. Um, so probably the research portal of your institution is based in pure or a similar software. Um, and indeed at the moment, pure only adds uh, publications so textual publications to ORCID records. That can be journal articles, books, book chapters, but it doesn't include at the moment data sets as part of their um, information. So I know they are working on that, but I don't know when this is going to be um, ready. Indeed, uh, the next Next question, a PID is a persistent identifier. Uh, I, I should be careful with that and I apologize for that uh, because sometimes I'm so in some um, uh, jargon that I use that without noticing that maybe in, uh, for other people um, that word is not that common. Um, I have another question here. What are the main barriers ORCID organization faces in achieving full interoperability across research systems? Um, well, this is a very interesting thing. Um, we have experiences so far that many organizations can, uh, from the technical point of view, um, integrate very quickly if they have the, um, the resources available. So if they have one person, for example, dedicated to uh, programming the, uh, the integration. Um, the ORCID API is quite practical to, uh, to use, but in many organizations, the problem is the lack of people that uh, is responsible for that integration. And also what we've seen in other cases, uh, of course, the technical part is important, but uh, there is also a, a community engagement part or a communication part. And also that part is um, sometimes quite challenging because even though organizations uh, do their best, sometimes I must admit uh, researchers might be overwhelmed so uh, it's a lot of new information, new links to click on um, and so on. And I've been, um, um, I've been seeing several, several use cases in the past years. And 
Also, in many cases, the ORCID connection might not be added in the best place or the workflow is not that um, user friendly sometimes. Um, so this might prevent that um, researchers interact with the platform, that the platform offers that connection, and at the end that there is a uh, full interoperability across research systems. Those are, um, in general, the main barriers that, that I've seen. Um, but the situation is way better. So we are achieving uh, a lot, I think. Uh, for example, in the UK, there are about 99 institutional integrations. So that's, that's a lot. And also we have big um, uh, providers, for example, the Open Journal system offering a direct connection with ORCID. And there are a lot of journals worldwide based on open journal systems. So I think the we are running in a good direction. And now with the need of more interoperability and findability of research outputs and connections with, with authors and co-authors, I think this is going to be um, improved as well. So there is always potential to improve how we at ORCID are uh, doing things. But I think we are in a good um, in a good direction. Great. Um, I um, I think there aren't any further questions here. I'm happy to answer if there are. Um, and of course, um, as mentioned, I will be sharing the um, slides afterwards. The recording is going to be available as well. And um, you can write me per uh, Twitter or write me an email or contact support at orchid.org if you have a question. I'm going to write it in the, in the chat. Um, this support at orchid.org if you have a question related to your orchid record so how you can enter information or if an information is incorrectly entered and so on you can definitely uh, write a message there and we usually answer uh, very quickly so you shouldn't have a problem with that and yes i think That would be it, I guess. So um, as a final word, um, I hope you, um, you got a, an overview about ORCID a bit further, so a bit beyond um, authentic authentication. And um, yeah, so also how to use ORCID through uh, the research uh, process. And yeah, I'm more, uh, more than happy to um, answer all the questions that you will have in the future. We publish regularly in the ORCID blog um, things that are interested um, in, from the wider perspective for the research community and also more detailed uh, topics like adding this type of information or that type or a new platform where you can uh, connect your um, ORCID. And that's it. So again, thank you very much for participating. And uh, thank you very much for hearing me for almost two hours. And yeah, I hope you have a very nice evening and stay well. <laughs>